Good afternoon and welcome to this press conference from the 48th annual meeting of the World Economic Forum here in Davos. Thank you for joining us here in the room. Thank you for watching the live stream, joining us there. Um, this press conference is dedicated to the humanitarian crisis that will shape 2018. Um, I'm joined uh, by my immediate left by Peter Maurer, who is the president of the International Committee of the Red Cross, ICRC, and uh, to his uh, left by Heba Ali, who is the director of Irene News. And we will be shortly joined on the panel uh, by Sara Pantoliano. She's the managing director of the Overseas Development Institute. She's making her way right now from the Congress Center through the snow to be with us. So thank you for your patience. As I said, she'll join us uh, in a second. But without further ado, um, Peter Mara, let's start. The humanitarian crisis that will shape 2018. Um, in the preparation and the conversations we had for this press conference, um, I learned that the basically the crisis that we've seen with the Rohingyas could have been prevented to a certain extent. At least it was <coughs> not a complete surprise, um, I I is what I learned, which surprised me in turn, because when you read the news as a normal reader, as a no normal uh, audience, um, you might not have been familiar with that situation. Um, what are the what are the major crises that your organization is preparing for to deal with in 2018? Well, good question. It allows me maybe uh, to start and say if the crisis of the Rohingyas could have been prevented, it's a little bit preposterous uh, to say that it could have been prevented at a certain moment. We are concerned with a lot of fragile contexts which have the potential to unfold into full-fledged conflict, but you rarely know when the degradation and the spiral will happen. And so my first point here this afternoon is a little bit that let's not fool ourselves as a humanitarian organization. We have to be prepared to crises is erupting wherever they erupt and to respond quickly to those crises. And in many of the places where we see fragile contexts uh, at the brink of war and violence and disruption, this goes from southern Philippines to Myanmar to Afghanistan to the Middle East to large parts of Africa, we see fragile contexts, but we don't know which one will eventually blow up in our face. A lot depends also, as everybody knows, success breeds success and failure breeds failure. Uh, successful negotiations around one of the conflict can suddenly take a conflict away from primary humanitarian concern and move it to more long-term peace building and developmental concern, while failure to do so may further escalate in a surprising way some of the conflict. So I'm not here to tell you what happens tomorrow. What uh, uh, may be three or four recurring issues from the front line of conflicts which will certainly shape 2018, I wanted uh, to mention them. First, you have seen us talk a lot in the context of Syria, in the context of Yemen, in the context of Ukraine, about urban warfare and w war and violence moving into cities. This will continue, this trend is most likely to continue and will challenge us as humanitarians in c terms of reconstruction and rehabilitating urban environments, which is of a particular challenge because in urban environments with little impact, you have big effect in the positive and in the negative. If you manage to re-establish the water distribution system in Thais, Yemen, you touch one million people, that's big. If you bomb the water distribution system in Thais, you touch a million people. So we are focusing particularly in some of those grave conflicts in 2018 on rehabilitating and stabilizing urban situations, either in trying to prevent further escalation of violence or to cope with some effects of violence. Second, uh, I'm just back from Sudan and Central African Republic where I spent uh, uh, the first uh, uh, two weeks, 10 days of the year. 
And it is obvious from, I'm speaking here in Davos, that one of the big issue for humanitarians is to encourage those who are not classical humanitarians to come on board and to step up to the plate in terms of finance and support for other than humanitarian activities. Let me be clear. When I look at some of the camps of displaced people from Darfur to South Kordofan to uh, Central African Republic, there is a potential of people helping themselves, uh, women r rallying other women to self-help groups. It's about refugees starting own businesses. But in all of the, what they try to do and what they do, they are very often left alone. And I think one of the big issue is how can we encourage, ask, demand from the wealthy business community worldwide to embrace and to support business activities by vulnerable displaced people. And this will fundamentally change the way we do humanitarian work. And I have continuously thought this is a place where we need to work together uh, with the business community because we have insights and intelligence into the drivers of fragile communities. And the business community has the money, the skills and the knowledge to support business activities of fragile people. And I think this is, has a huge potential. And if we manage to accelerate and to grow this area of work, this is important. Thirdly, I'm here also in Davos because I'm deeply convinced that we are confronted in 2018 more than ever with a big gap between needs of people and the capacity of the international system as a whole to respond. And this gap can only be bridged by more and better finance. And more and better finance means that we need to discuss with the specialists uh, in the financial industries, in the private sector, in the humanitarian sector about how we can find new tools, new instruments in order to more generously finance humanitarian operations. This is about how to learn from our what we tried to do from humanitarian impact bond, impact investment. It's about finding new cash solutions for problems. It's about advanced market finance. It's about new credits, uh, new credit facilities, blended finance. We have a panoply of tools at the present moment available. And if I see correctly, the funding gap in 2018 will become bigger. It will become more important. And it needs to be addressed by a multiplicity of responses as we are, uh, as we see them now emerging from the discussions uh, here in Davos. Fourth point, let me just draw the attention of all of you of what we call at uh, the ICRC forgotten conflicts and forgotten people. I'm concerned at the present moment to look in 2018s and to see that the dynamic of high visibility conflicts with high investment of humanitarian assistance is sucking money away from low visibility conflict and big needs of people. And, and I think we all know what we mean. We have high visibility conflicts. Syria is high visibility. It's at the crossroads of strategic interests of powers. And a lot of money is made available uh, to address the Syrian crisis. But much less is uh, addressed to some of the fragile contexts in Africa, in the Sahel, in the Lake Chad Basin, in the uh, Great Lakes Basin, in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. These are potential big conflict areas, big needs areas. And there is no question when I visit those places that needs objectively uh, people are bigger in those places than in many others. So it is important, uh, an important challenge for 2018 to draw the attention of uh, the donor community, of the international community, to the potential of escalating violence and warfare and needs in low visibility conflict with big needs. And the last point is that uh, as we are speaking here in Davos, of course, 
we are still looking into how best to do and to use digital capacities to do good. I think digitalization of the economy has multiple facets. I don't go into that. But there is a huge potential in fostering digital technologies and digital tools in order to do better and more targeted humanitarian assistance. Not everything works. Not everything is, is, is working, but we need to scale up uh, our capacity. This goes into cash transfers. It goes into new digital platforms, which allows us better analytics of needs, which goes into data analytics, which goes into the whole discussion on how we organize the protection of data with the sharing of data. I think in terms of delivering good humanitarianism in 2018, this will be a critical issue. I'll stop it here. Thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, Sarah, welcome and, and thank you for joining. I'll, I'll let you catch your breath uh, yeah. for another moment and we'll turn to, to you first, Heba. Uh, as a director of IRA News, I'll, I'll be a little bit unfair now to you um, because obviously you are focused on humanitarian issues and you are covering them. Uh, but Peter Amaura mentioned the importance of forgotten conflicts and visibility. Um, what are the mechanisms that turn your media colleagues to cover an event, and what do you think will the, the, the big media stories be in that field in 2018, if you will? Hmm. Yeah, for those of you who don't know, Erin, we're a news service that is dedicated solely to covering humanitarian crises from the field. And I think we are freed from some of the restraints or pitfalls that other media face because we're a nonprofit news organization, because we're independent, because we don't have that commercial driver. And so that allows us to pursue some of the stories that other media may want to but, but cannot um, in at least the same level of depth or breadth. Um, and I think because of the budget cuts we've seen in the media industry over the last few decades, um, many, as you know, media organizations have had to cut foreign bureaus and thus prioritize coverage of crises to those that, as Peter mentioned, are more geopolitically relevant, are of strategic interest to particular countries, um, where the story behind the, cris the crisis is more compelling, plays better on TV, where the victims are people that we can relate to, or the destinations, um, popular tourist locations. So I think there's a lot of factors that play into whether a coverage gets more crisis, uh, sorry, <laughs> crisis gets more coverage um, or not, and, and one of them, frankly, is access of the media, particularly in the landscape where um, you know, crises are getting more complex, more actors involved, and even aid workers are, are struggling to reach the people in need, let alone journalists coming from the outside. I think what allows us to be a bit different is our model is one based on uh, a network of uh, local correspondents on the ground. We're not parachuting people into crises, but we're there before a crisis even begins, and that gives us a certain vantage point to be able to foresee um, into the future. And I think maybe just to pick up on what um, Peter uh, questioned off of the top about whether the Rohingya crisis was predictable. We've been f raising an alarm about the Rohingya since 2008, when tensions really began in uh, Myanmar. And since then, repeatedly, we've been saying there are I issues here that will get worse and worse if not addressed and now everyone knows where we stand today. So it's not to say that of course an aid worker um, is faced with a number of, of different crises around the world and it's hard to prioritize with limited resources but it is to say that many of the crises that we see today begin as human rights crises, as um, tensions and the warning signs are clear. I think often um, at least for, for us on the ground, we're seeing this and we're communicating it. Um, early warning exists, early action doesn't always follow for a number of reasons. Um, so from our vantage point, I think 2018 looks quite grim for a few reasons. Um, uh, the impact of climate change, I think, is becoming much more tangible, and we're seeing that particularly for small island states uh, last year in the Pacific and in the Caribbean. Um, the global refugee crisis is entering a new and I think much more challenging phase when we talk about long-term solutions and options for integration. And as the scale and complexity of crises grow, the financing, as Peter mentioned, um, available to respond to them, but more importantly, the political will that exists particularly today is certainly in question. 
um, let alone the fact that we're seeing an increase in um, breaches of the rules of war that mean that this is only likely to increase over the coming year. Um, so I suppose apart from the, the big stories that um, you're all following closely, the ones that keep us up at night are the Burundis of the world, are the Central African Republics of the world, are the South Sudans of the world. And I wanted to zero in on the Democratic Republic of Congo in particular because I think that's one where uh, 2018 is likely to um, be a moment in which it explodes even further than it already has. Um, over the last year, it has been slipping further and further into humanitarian catastrophe. Uh, you have a situation where uh, not only are we seeing new waves of violence um, in op resistance to uh, President Joseph Kabila's refusal to step down, but we have long-standing um, intercommunal tensions, you have food insecurity, you have the world's largest displacement crisis, uh, and you have um, increasing uh, cutbacks on the money available for the humanitarian response, but also for the peacekeeping mission uh, in line with some of the cuts that the United States has made recently. So it's really a combination of, of quite a, a catastrophic set of factors, and um, our investigative unit recently uncovered a new wave of um, a campaign of, of rape by army soldiers against villagers in uh, areas where they are fighting rebels. Uh, and we've heard really brutal stories of women being gang raped, 65-year-old um, blind woman gang raped to death. Uh, so really horrendous stuff that um, looks likely to increase over the coming years. So that's one that we're certainly watching, but one of many. Uh, every year we produce a, um, an outlook on crises in the year ahead, uh, which you can find on our website that lists the top 10 that we're watching, um, as well as a map of uh, the number of conflicts under way around the world today, and we're talking about more than 40. So to put things in perspective, uh, the Syrias and Myanmar's of the world are, are just two of many, many other crises that are brewing away under the surface. And I'll just close by mentioning that tomorrow evening, uh, we will be hosting an event, um, both IRAN and ODI, with the UN Under Secretary General for Humanitarian Affairs. So for those of you who are looking for more detail on the humanitarian outlook in 2018, uh, you're welcome to join us, and I'll have details here afterwards. Thank you very much, Sarah. Uh, I introduced you earlier as the Managing Director of the uh, Overseas Development Institute, ODI. For those of you watching who are not familiar with the organization, it's the leading think tank on humanitarian issues. So clearly, um, you are looking at these, at these topics as well. What are the potential crises, I say, for 2018 that keep you up at night? Thanks. Um, well, I, I follow from Iber, um, you know, a, no, a lot of the crises are in a way predictable. You know, you can see the same mixture of, of issues that surface that contribute to, you know, turn a situation into a humanitarian crisis. And it's usually a combination of human rights abuse, you know, violation of human rights, eco economic deterioration, if not collapse, and societal fractures. And if I look at a number of countries out there, I think there are two or three that, you know, um, really seriously concern me, worry me. Uh, they have the potential to escalate in a full-blown cri blown crisis. I hope it doesn't happen, but the signs are there. The first, of course, is Venezuela. Um, for anybody who is monitoring things in Venezuela, we're very, very close uh, to really calling it uh, a full-blown humanitarian crisis. And what we're seeing is, you know, a tremendous concentration of power, an increasing concentration of power in the hands of, you know, the, the Maduro administration. But with that, you know, an increasing um, um, uh, quite heavy-handed um, uh, action against the opposition. We see arbitrary arrests, we see prosecutions, we see abuses reported, you know, from uh, security forces. These are, you know, things that Human Rights Watch and others have documented. But also what we see in the streets is, you know, severe shortage of medicines. We see an economic collapse of the country. We see people, you know, sort of queuing for food. We've seen 200 and, and um, 36,000 um, people from Venezuela crossing into Ecuador, you know, people have done that because they're desperate and what they cite as, you know, the principal reason for the crossing is lack of access to medical care um, and, and political pr uh, prosecution. So 15,000 people have, you know, sought asylum just in the last few months. These are very worrying signs and, you know, it's something that I think we need to watch really careful, carefully because the potential to escalate into full bone humanitarian crisis is really, really um, um, clear. 
Another country that keeps you awa awake at night is Mozambique. We see some of the simu uh, you know, a somewhat similar situation um, with, well, of course, increasing tensions between the government and RENAMO, the Mozambican National Resistance um, um, group that is now a political party, but obviously was in, an opponent during the war in Mozambique. But we see you know, abuses, serious abuses against civilians, both from you know, government forces, allegedly, and as well as you know, um, RENAMO, summary executions, forced disappearances, sexual violence. But at the same time, we see a phenomenally fast economic deterioration. You know, if you look at what's happened, you know, somebody has called it the perfect storm that you know the country suffered in 2016—a combination of you know unfa unfavorable fluctuations in exchange rates, runaway inflation, 25 percent, um, and inability to repay debt, particularly as a result of you know gas prices uh, plummeting. Um, and if you put this all together, you see you know really fast economic deterioration of the country. And also other challenges, you know, climatic related challenges are also sort of impacting on the country. So we're seeing, you know, rising temperatures and less predictable rains, increased risk of flooding that are all contributing to create, uh, unfortunately, rather perfect conditions for a humanitarian crisis. And last, but the list doesn't end here. There are many other countries that worry me, but I think those are the top three, is, uh, is El Salvador. Um, where again, you know, we already see um, a country that is one of the most violent in the world, where you know the level, the levels of homicides are so high that make it one of the the, the deadliest places on uh, um, on earth. Um, but we see an increasing number of people trying to run away. You know, we've seen 90,000 people just in in, in in the last few months leaving, you know, running, fleeing, you know, El Salvador. And at the same time, obviously, people being repatriated from the U.S. Uh, at an increasing pace, many of which actually, you know, are deep repatri uh, repatriated because of engagement in, you know, in, in crime or in petty crimes. More recently, of course, not, but, you know, that is compounding the challenges that the country is already, you know, facing and, uh, um, and having to, to deal with. And, and, and closer to home, Bosnia, but I won't elaborate that on that, but that's definitely another one that we should be, you know, sort of more uh, uh, concerned about. These are all preventable crises. You know, these are all signs that we can recognize country after country that, you know, these are, these are all related to political problems that need early attention, early investment, early action, and actually, you know, early investment in, in, in diplomacy, you know, in trying to diffuse some of these tensions, early investment in trying to mitigate some of the economic challenges that these countries are, uh, um, are facing. And I would say, you know, since this is the forum, there is a role for businesses as well in trying and stabilize these situations before they become, you know, incredibly wicked humanitarian problems. Um, they so can, so, so what's, yeah. what's your message to the, to the CEOs well, the here in Davos? The businesses really have a critical role to play, they can facilitate political dialogue. They can, you know, help invest in situations where actually do require, you know, the, the engagement of businesses to bring up the economy, to you know, make um, wage disparities less critical, to to really um, stabilize the economic situation. But actually, you know, big businesses have power in terms of the political um, dialogue that they can also bring to these places. Thank you, Sarah. And let me pick up on, on something um, before we open the floor for question that, that you mentioned, and I'd like to, to put that question to the three of you. you. You all paint, obviously, a very grim picture, and I understand access is becoming more of a problem. The nature of warfare is, is changing. There's more and more crises uh, popping up that are escalating. It's not just political issues, it's climate change. Um, how optimistic are you that we can even get to to a mode of operation where we where we focus on prevention and, and, and are able to to do more than just putting out fire and prevent these conflicts from happening? Sarah, so if you want to, yeah, I'm so happy to start because actually I think we have an incredible champion in the Secretary General of the UN that is really trying to put prevention at the heart of his agenda and is, has been trying to rally support, you know, both from member states and from you know his peers in the UN and really making sure that. Um, the UN family and its partners for a start, you know, bring more attention to these issues. There is an innate 
you know, reluctance, though, to do that, particularly when human rights issues are involved. Countries don't like to discuss that. Um, you know, UN organizations in countries, and as well as others, don't like to raise these issues because, you know, it can obviously lead to um, uh, unsavory consequences. Uh, but it is, you know, that leadership that is required, is the leadership to, you know, ensure that we really take prevention seriously and, you know, we in a way, engage, you know, it doesn't have to be public, it doesn't have to be, you know, denunciation, but we have the private demarches, you know, the ICRC is very well known for, that can encourage countries to see that it is in their interest to defuse crisis, it is in their interest to act early so that the situation doesn't escalate and does, and, you know, end up in a full-blown humanitarian crisis. Thank you, Sarah. You want to react to that? Just from the media perspective, I, I suppose I'd add that uh, despite the very diffused information landscape in which we exist today, there is research that shows that decision makers are still very influenced by mainstream media coverage. And the extent to which um, it is difficult to uh, prioritize within media organizations coverage of crises that are not yet full-blown crises, that has a spillover effect <coughs> on the degree to which politicians pay attention and um, that more generally people are mobilized around an issue. So I think there is a responsibility on us as media as well to be going beyond uh, or bringing some of these other crises up onto the radar so that we, we can create that kind of spillover effect that leads to the kind of prevention you're talking about. But then I'll, I'll add, as I said off the top, that often even when there is early warning, there isn't always early action. And I think bridging that gap in terms of when, when we are putting out the red flags, that, that there's an international system that is set up to be able to respond to them is an important gap that I think um, hopefully is, is now currently being looked at. From our point of view, I'm quite optimistic uh, about two or three things with that we are observing in the areas of operation. First, we just started uh, a couple of months ago a major project in looking at where do we find positive examples of respect for international humanitarian law? And actually, if we don't look only at violations, but at positive examples, we find a lot of those positive examples. So it's also about are we able to accelerate and scale those positive examples to learn from positive examples? And I think there is at least a potential that international humanitarian law, if we look at it as a guiding principle for a lot of actors in some of the difficult situations has much more positive potential than we usually would think. Second, uh, I'm always impressed by the resilience of community and by their capacity to help themselves even in the worst of situations. And I think we should not put all our eggs, of course, it needs international support, but it's my positive appreciation also comes from all the thousands of examples where people have an ability to help themselves, to organize themselves. Afterwards, they need more support, but it's not that there is nothing and we are waiting for the crisis which comes. There is a lot positive energy in some of the war-torn and conflict-torn society and it needs support. And I think it is important to shift a little bit uh, the perspective. And my third point is that when, again, I agree with my two colleagues uh, beforehand, I think prevention is important and in prevention, uh, talking to influencers is important. We just started and re did a new reassessment on what influences behaviors of actors in conflict. And what we see is sometimes surprising. A good identification of good influencers can do a lot because we suspect influencers where they are not and there are none when we th where we think they are. Uh, Important, uh, sorry, I, I let fall my glasses about this. Uh, what I find very interesting is that influencers of behavior, positive behavior in tensions societies is not hierarchical influence, but it's very often community-based influence is religious leaders, 
its community leaders, its traditional leaders. And I think one of the most powerful hope-injecting element that we find in war-torn society, violence-torn society, is to build on those influencers and to find way to change behavior. And there, there are interesting and positive examples. There are those hospitals which are not attacked. And I think it is important to ask why and to build on this experience. There are those civilian neighborhoods which are not bombed. Why, how, where can we put the triggers? And these are all important elements of hope. Thank you very much. Um, let's open the floor for question. I've seen Mr. Otto from the German News Agency raise his hand. If you can pass the microphone. Thank you. Uh, hello, thank you. Uh, a question to Ms. Pantoliano. Can you just say one or two sentences about why you're worried about Bosnia? Sure. <laughs> Are we taking a few? Or? No, no, go. Yeah. I, th I think it comes from, well, actually from a, a personal <laughs> experience. I, I visited Bosnia a couple of years ago. I spent quite a bit of time with uh, friends who live in Bosnia, but in, in the Serbian in part of, of, um, of Bosnia, and, and just the discussions at night made me very uncomfortable uh, uh, around the level of animosity and tension that still is very palpable in, in those communities. And clearly, you know, the recent events with the celebration of uh, um, the, the, the 9th of January holiday that commemorates, you know, the date in which uh, Bosnian Serbs declared the creation of the Serbsk Republic, um, which in theory is not allowed, but clearly continues to be celebrated in the defiance, um, you know, that has accompanied that. It's a, it, it, it's a sign of things that have been brewing for a long time. Um, it's not a recent event. You know, it builds on tensions that are very deep and palpable if, you know, you travel through Bosnia. Thank you. Uh, do we have any other questions? Can I get a show of hands? Yes, there's a gentleman in the middle. If you could state your name and organization, please. Sure. Ishan the ruler of the Washington Post. Uh, if I could just ask the typical annoying American question. Um, how does uh, the existence of an administration in Washington that, at least from uh, the executive, has not shown much sympathy towards the humanitarian plights elsewhere, is working towards cutting funding to various uh, major institutions that, that uh, reckon with these humanitarian challenges. Um, what kind of message do you have for the Trump administration and for the president as he comes to Davos this week? Thank you very much. Who wants to take on that question, Peter? <laughs> <laughs> the diplomat. Well, uh, I mean, f first and foremost, I think uh, the key message is that humanitarian work is intrinsically stabilizing societies and and this is in the interest not only of the united states but uh, of much more relatively stable countries today uh, in order to to, to continue uh, supporting these areas and i think there is a lot of proof in that frontline humanitarian work close to people, close to front lines, close to violence, uh, is a big, one of the biggest stabilizers of societies. Most of the displacement happens in countries where there is war. Most of the needs are happening in those countries. Uh, the second largest tier of needs is in the neighboring countries of conflict countries, so there is a a whole sort of case to make towards a political agenda in the United States that this is the most powerful and most effective stabilizing effect. My second point is to be very frank that with regard to ICRC, the United States continued to generously fund our activity this year and we hope that this will continue. And. Uh, uh, in, in the course of 2018, because I think we made a case, all of us here uh, on the podium, that problems will not be less, but rather more. Do you want to add to that? You can leave it at that. <laughs> okay, so we'll, we'll wait for the speech by the President on Friday and hope he, he covers humanitarian issues there. 
Do we have any other questions I in the think room? The journalist was waiting for our speech to the president. <laughs> well, I'm not stopping you. I'm not stopping no, you. No, no. <laughs> Do we have any other questions? But, but actually, there, is, there okay. is an important point, I think, that domestically there is a lot of support for uh, um, you know, the role that the U.S. has traditionally played in responding to humanitarian crisis. Perhaps there is less um, you know, public support also from you know, the supporters of um, you know, the, the, if you want the, the base that the, president's, uh, the president enjoys for you know, more kind of Longer term development aid, but the you know, American people are very proud of their uh, record in uh, uh, you know, so solidarity and support in humanitarian crisis. So, whilst obviously you know, there are challenges to some of the funding that the US continues to provide internationally, I think this you know, humanitarian response is probably one of those that we will see less challenged um, in, in this respect because they, they, you know, I think the president himself attaches importance to that. That said, we have actually done some analysis on the impact of um, U.S. funding cuts and some of the big U.N. agencies like the World Food Program, like um, the U.N. Refugee Agency, where significant portions of their funding and up to 25 percent come from the U.S. government, could then face very serious um, limitations on the work that they're able to do. And our, our reporting had found that in 2017 there was less of an impact because that budget had been more or less protected, but that we could start to see the implications of that in 2018 and moving forward. And we've already seen on the peacekeeping side some of that. Um, so I think, as you said, in, in the past, humanitarian aid has had bad bipartisan support from the U.S., but it's, um, I can tell you that there are a lot of aid agencies that are very, very worried about this. Thank you very much. Uh, in a very un-Swiss way, we uh, started late, we're ending late, sorry <laughs> about that uh, for running over time a little bit, but I think this uh, discussion deserves the room and, and space given here today. Thank you very much to my panelists thank and you. thank you for being here. Thank you. Thanks.